All right. All right. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. So those of you in the back, there is a lot of room in the front. You know, if you want to come front, you know, you don't like a particular answer by one of the panelists, you can even accost them. You know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you for coming. You know, it's always a pleasure to be in person. I did a lot of KubeCon talks uh, virtual, right? We got a what, three o'clock in the morning for one of these, but, uh, but um, you know, it's, it's great to be in person. It's four o'clock, it's a reasonable time. People are here, but this is your panel. You know, so be ready with the questions. I'm just gonna do a quick round of introductions and after that it's all yours, okay? So feel free to ask some of the tough questions. Make these panelists squirm. They know everything about networking and IPv6, so you know, um, so I think it'll be cool. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Nobody knows everything about it, right? Um, before I get started, how many of you are already familiar with dual stack networking? Oof. Okay. All right, that's, come to the that's stage. You're in the right room. Yeah, yeah, it's in a perfect room. How do we make it here? Okay. How many of you are already on the IPv6 bandwagon when it comes to Kubernetes? Oof. Whoa, okay, that's very cool. Last question. On a scale of one to 10, a networking geek, right, is 10, and really know nothing about, you know, kind of the different levels or whatever, right? That's one, and I'm somewhere like a level two, level three, something like that. How many are you above a level six or level seven? A few, oh. okay. So you All guys right. can't ask any questions, okay? No, they're, they're gonna <laughs> answer the questions. <laughs> yes. No, but, but thanks again for coming. Uh, this is your panel. Uh, so um, I have a great August panel in May. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, I let them introduce themselves. So be ready to ask some questions. I'm gonna run around with a handheld mic. Please wait. Okay, don't yell, yell out because you know there are virtual audience who are listening as we speak. So I don't wanna ignore uh, any of them. So thanks for coming virtual audience as well. Uh, with that said, let's go from left to right or right to left or whatever they, you know, start with Tim. Hi everyone, my name is Tim. Um, I work at Google, I've been on Kubernetes for a long time, I'm one of the SIG leads for SIG networking, and if you hate the dual stack API, it's probably my fault. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dinesh from Sivo. I've been implementing some of the V6 dual stack into our cloud platform, which we then offer out to customers as a Kubernetes service. Wonderful, hello everybody. How's everybody doing? Good? Thank you, thank you. I need the energy, I need the energy. <laughs> My name is Lachlan Evenson, I work at Microsoft. Uh, I actually worked uh, in SIG Network on the dual stack feature in Kubernetes, so really excited to hear from you all. We wanna make it better, uh, so uh, please ask questions either today or you can find me online. I'd really love to just hear about how it's being used. So all these hands, you know, this is a year of IPv6, Linux on the desktop. It's gonna be this year. <laughs> I've been waiting for 25. Like, like, like we Kubernetes did Kubernetes is that Trojan horse that's gonna get V6 out there in the world. So I'm very excited to hear how you're all using it and learning and making it better. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lockie. Uh, I will say that uh, if Kubernetes um, having IPv6 is uh, one really good thing that happens uh, this year, I guess it was technically right at the end of last year, but if everybody implements it this year, then you may possibly single-handedly uh, fix 2022. So please go back and do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm Bridget, uh, I work on Lockheed's team. And if you uh, would like to register a complaint about or perhaps a pull request to the docs for IPv6 or the code examples that I worked on with Loggy or the blog post or, you know, oh, come and bike shed the production readiness review. I feel like we could have done a little bit more with that. Yeah. Why not? So, uh, but yeah, happy to chat about it. Perfect. So anybody have any question, but, you know, while you're warming up, uh, I think uh, that was a good segue into the question that I was going to ask, which is, uh, I'm a developer, I'm an app developer, right? And, uh, you know, Kubernetes networking was great because it was kind of like an extended VM, right? You know, it got its own IP address and all that I needed to do was kind of wire up the IP address or something like that. But as a developer, do I really care about IPv6? Should I really care about IPv6? And if I do, 
what are my resources to get started? You know, there are not a whole lot out there. You know, I mean, I tried looking for them. Um, so can you, can you point developers in the right direction? Uh, give some ideas. How many, how many of you think that this is a problem? You know, that, um, yeah, yeah, I see a lot of things going up. So, so let's, let's look at this from a developer perspective and especially from an app, app developer perspective. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I hope the answer is your cluster administrators can set it up correctly so it's not a terrible burden. But I'm looking at Tim blinking behind his mask and I think maybe he thinks, mm, well, how much of a terrible burden do we expect this to be for people? My feeling here is if you don't know you care, you don't care. Um, this is a space where you shouldn't, most people should not have to care. 98% of, of applications and users, this should be transparent to them. Um, and for those people who do care, that's where the APIs that we've added are, but they're all optional. And we were like super rigorous about making sure that nobody breaks, nobody changes automatically. And for most users, nothing changes behaviorally. I think uh, I don't agree with that. Really? <laughs> so for, for end users, what we've kind of had with Kubernetes and V4 is that our pods are almost hidden by default, right? They don't, uh, they're not addressable on the internet. Mm -hmm. And going down the V6 and the dual stack route, all of your pods suddenly become addressable and routable and reachable from the public internet, which is a really, really dangerous thing exactly. for the uneducated. Um, so there's a huge amount of resources that we need to create as a community to give developers an understanding of what happens when you put, say, your Redis directly routable on the internet. Wait, so you're saying that the red teams should be paying attention right now? <laughs> they should be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, from my perspective, one of the biggest barriers to adoption for IPv6 is the, you know, the overhead to get started with it. And I really think a platform like Kubernetes, which can extract a lot of those challenges in addressing and understanding the addressing away from being the burden on a developer is really, could be really empowering. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, this, you know, it's as simple as setting a field and a service to actually put something on the, on the public internet. But I, I do, there are some idiosyncrasies to IPv6, which are just a little different. And one of them is that every, all IP addresses are routable on the internet. Right. It doesn't mean that you can connect to them all. Um, but if you don't set things up right, that could be a hassle. And in the IPv4 internet, the world we live today, we've relied on this system called NAT to keep everybody safe out of the box. Exactly. And that kind of goes away, which NAT actually breaks the internet most of the time. So I'm hopeful that in the IPv6 internet, we can actually have better connectivity. But I, you know, back to your original question, it should be as simple as setting a field to say, I want dual stat networking. So from a developer perspective, what we hear from the community and from customers uh, is I need to present my application on both the IPv4 internet and the IPv6 internet. And why they're asking this is typically driven today by regulation. We have some regulation by a country that we operate in to have to present services that are part of a government or any kind of other international organization. There are regulations that are moving companies to have to present them on both internets. And that's why we think, you know, having dual stack gives developers a path to actually start onboarding and getting a feel for IPv6 without, you know, drinking, having to convert everything at the same time. Gotcha. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, and, and I think it's partly cultural too, right? You know, um, for example, like you said, you know, it, the perception that each of these IPs might be routable might itself be a you know, kind of a uh, uh, red flag, so to say, right? Yeah. Um, so, so can you address some of those issues of actually, um, you know, moving from IPv4 to IPv6, not necessarily from a Kubernetes perspective, but from a general perspective and, and, and kind of talk about some of the challenges there and how do you mitigate them, you know, so. I, I wonder if we want to back up just a tiny bit too and warn people that if you have been in the Kubernetes space looking at this and you're thinking, Oh yeah, I tried the alpha. Just be aware there's some nuance there yes. because we did re-implement the alpha, the alpha specifically to reduce the complexity on the end user. So if you tried it and you thought, wow, this is way too hard to use, 
you might want to try it again. If you haven't tried it since uh, 1.20, you may want to try it again because it probably did change. I, yeah, I'd agree with that. So I've been working on implementing this stuff over the past few weeks because, you know, like, nothing like last minute homework. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is pretty simple to get V6 onto a cluster now in, in the latest version. So the improvements are really good. <laughs> um, it's just that, you know, obviously found that danger out the box, mm -hmm. which is really key. The actual other thing is that GitHub isn't on the V6 internet, which is a huge barrier to entry, because the first thing we did was spin up a V6 only cluster and a V6 only network and couldn't get to GitHub. Yeah, the things you needed weren't on the IPv6 internet. So the right. good thing is now you can hold all those companies accountable. <laughs> Some cloud APIs aren't even on the v6 internet. Last, last I heard, I thought you know, GitHub was bought out by Microsoft. Yeah, right? so. I think uh, I probably have some colleagues that... They were waiting for this... Fe they, were, they said they were waiting for this feature to land, so... Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can send them a Twitter DM. That's the correct way to message your colleagues, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. I think, so, to go back to your question, I think, so there are customers that uh, want to use IPv6 only, but for everybody else, I think Dualstack offers the best of both worlds to yeah. get started. Yeah. Because it's not just the transport. It's all your application software communicating Correct. on yeah, that. Exactly. And a lot of the pathways, even in different application codes, those implementations on different networking stacks are a little less mature. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good way, hey, I present it on both, and I start to get a feel for IPv6 and how it operates. And I start to get comfortable with uh, you know, operating different service discovery, all these different mechanisms. And you've got V4 there to, to serve the production workload. So you've got a great way to start getting a feel for how V6 functions. And I really think it's key because we do get a lot of, well, I just want to go to IPv6. And I said, well, go and see what works and see what breaks. And uh, sadly, most customers end up coming back and end up saying, well, I actually need dual stack because I actually need to sometimes get to the IPv4 and internet and how do I do that? And dual stack offers that kind of... On ramp. And, and I think that's related to the, when we're talking and all of us, you know, in some capacity talk to production user customers, um, they aren't necessarily in a greenfield. So they might have some backing data store that uses legacy whatever, or they might have some hybrid situation where they can't put V6 on everything. So setting up a, hey, we have an ideal V6, V6 scenario, it's great. You can do that in a, in a test lab, but you can't necessarily do that in production, and that's fine. That's where everyone is. It's not just you. <laughs> okay. Um, audience, any questions? Uh, I, ha I have a few. Yeah, let's get this gentleman a mic. Let me see if I can jump. Hi. Uh, so you're saying that uh, IPv6 uh, may not be for everyone, and people need IPv4 too. I agree on some part, but why is not the NAT64 a solution? Because to me, it seems that uh, getting dual stack kind of brings more problems than it solves. You get the problems from both IPv4 and IPv6. So preference would be IPv6 cluster with the NAT64 to get outside. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great point, and uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, the situation we're in because we have this in-person and virtual. There are two channels, and I have to kind of look at those two channels. So it's all a little confusing. So what do you think of just going IPv6, like the gentleman said? All right, well, I can jump on this one, having having had done this before with uh, NAT64. A couple of things your back-end services aren't actually running IPv6. Here's slack is Sorry. You might wanna... That's fine, that's fine. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, so your, your application software makes no changes and therefore even on the back-end, you're never actually testing the application software and, and having done this for a service provider in the past, um, actually getting IPv6 end-to-end -end is actually a better state overall for many different reasons, transport reasons, uh, overhead reasons, routing reasons. But if you never actually turn it on right to you and plug it right into your application software, you don't actually know the challenges that you're gonna face in service discovery and a whole bunch of other things. So I think getting that end-to-end -end connectivity 
because we come from the IPv4 world and we all grew up under it, we think we can bring all the old problems from IPv4 to v6 and say, well, let's just put NATs in front of everything because that's what we did in v4. I think, you know, that is, that's been one way to actually do this, but I think what we want to get out to is, is being hinged to NATing forever and keeping IPv4. Now, on the back end too, large clusters is becoming a thing. Now, we can't go to a customer and say, give us a slash eight because you want to run 70,000 pods. Give us Why a, not? Why not? You, you can. You can. And you can do, <laughs> we've done some fun things in Kubernetes like non-contiguous blocks and a whole bunch of stuff to stitch large clusters together and make them functional. I think, you know, with IPv6, we have a lot more headroom in addressing and actually being able to utilize that addressing on the back end can actually help us meet scaling and cluster needs. So I think while there is the regulation and compliance pieces, there's also the, do you really have enough address space to put 10,000 pods in a cluster and make sure they can go up and down like an accordion, in and out like an accordion, and have enough headroom in your cluster to do that. So I also see dual stacks serving that function as well as how do we actually get out of this addressing problem on the back end. So you might actually put V4 on the front end and V6 on the back. So you could do a four to six NAT so that you could actually have just a, uh, a single stack back end. Anyway, I'm getting into the wage. I can talk about IPv6 all day. I, I hope, I'm hopeful that um, dual stack is a, is a transitory thing, right? And yep. as people get more familiar with V6 uh, and the V6 internet, you know, becomes a, a, a complete thing that um, people will start to drain off their needs for v4, right? And we'll be able to see those things end of life over time. I mean, that's the goal for the last 20 years, but um, this time we're for real. And having implemented v6 recently as well, it wasn't just for clusters, v4 NAT versus v6 rootable everywhere. v6 rootable is absolutely a joy to use. When you get it set up and you understand it and you put a really simple addressing structure into your whole network, everything just falls into place. Kubernetes was designed on an assumption that all pods were reachable and that they were on the larger network, right? And that was great at sort of small scale. It doesn't work everywhere, especially in big places where, you know, there isn't a slash eight or a slash 16 to give you. Um, and so we, we find a lot of customers, uh, users doing what we call island mode, right? I've, I've written some talks on this. Um, and they put their clusters in an island and then they only poke holes or, or build bridges off the island for specific services. And that works, but it's not what Kubernetes was really designed to do. And so uh, we're seeing now with dual stack, people who do island v4 and flat v6. And we think that's a really nice intermediate step. Yeah. So I don't, I don't want to forget the virtual audience. I'll come to you in a second, but uh, here's a question. I don't want you guys to turn back, but I'll read it out. My organization would like to use IPv6 ULA addresses in both on-prem and public cloud hosted Kubernetes, but this still seems to be on the roadmap, correct? What's the underlying issue for this coming later? I can take a shot if you want to. I'm not sure I know what the answer is here. Yeah, so there are many different address types in IPv6. ULA is one, so it's just different levels of addressing. I think what we wanted to do, so to throw the, the answer back, is we'd love to hear about your use case and actually understand how we want to do addressing and which addressing. So which link local addressing, ULAs, we want to understand how you want this to operate. I've heard this feedback. So if, if you're the one asking the question, please come talk to SIG Network and give us the feedback because if you want to do different addressing schemes, we basically came up with one that worked to serve a function to get the feature on the ground and, and start getting feedback. So I have heard this more than once, and I would love either an issue in SIG network so we can start to discuss, but bring your use case. We really want to understand how you want to carve up the addresses. And when, he, when you say an issue in SIG network, um, you can put the issue in, in KK, in, in the Kubernetes repo, and label it. You can also come to the SIG network meetings. We meet every two weeks, on, uh, early, in the, uh, early to midday, midday for Europe um, on Thursdays, and we're nice. So come to the meeting. Or you can send email to the SIG network mailing list, which is linkable through the 
Kubernetes community sites. Um, all of these will, will get to our attention and we'll be able to discuss. Yeah, we need a discussion about this. I can't answer it without knowing it all, but I think starting that discussion is critical. So if that's you asking that question, please come and ask it to SIG Network. Gentlemen over there. Yeah. So I have a question around the security or default security with NUT for v4. So we had that default security. Is there a way or are you currently working on a solution for v6 that you can have a network policy as a default for the whole cluster so that developers not, are not accidentally exposing services? And I think, I think this is a, you know, there's a ramification in general, right? I mean, Kubernetes uh, uh, IPv6, the dual stack, pretty much hit every component in Kubernetes, right? You know, not just security, right? So maybe security is one manifestation of that, but, but maybe you can address it generally as well. Sure, so it's, um, we have some work going on that's not specific to IPv6, but happens to answer this question at the same time. Um, there's a proposal for a new API called Admin Network Policy, ANP. Um, and its original name was Cluster Network Policy, but the goal was to actually keep the same API for multi-cluster. So multi-cluster cluster network policy didn't roll off the tongue. Um, <laughs> so admin network policy is, um, uh, and is similar to the network policy API, but a little bit more sophisticated aimed at cluster admins or, or fleet admins. Um, and specifically, it's designed to impose the guardrails above what network policy is allowed to express. I I can jump in there too, unless jump in. anybody else wants to jump in. So what we needed to do, because we kept rags, can I? Can you move to that way so I can at least address the person asking the question? Sorry. Um, what we needed to do, because we kept getting stuck, was none of the upper level abstractions could consume dual stack or even IPv6, because nobody was using it, right? So we needed to create all the core APIs and componentry. So now all the network can pro providers can have dual stack networking if they choose to adopt it. And now I, I'm hopeful that we'll see, you know, all the CRDs and abstractions start to model that because they're all blocked on not having the API in Kubernetes core. So if that's you, again, please come and talk to us and talk to your, your, your cloud network provider or whoever you're using to get your IP addresses. <laughs> because if it's you, sorry, I'm putting that back on you, but we need to start showing examples and getting it throughout the documentation, but this, we couldn't put the, the horse before the cart. You know what, what I mean? We couldn't start writing about upper level things that needed to come into play, like all the CNI providers and how that works. We needed to get the core APIs in and I, that's what we've done. So now that people can play with this, we can actually rationalize, well, how do we model default network policies at an IPv6 level? Because we were, everything was stuck on, well, I don't have it and nobody was using IPv6 on its own, or very little people. So I'm hoping that you know this kind of gets the conversation around how do we model those things in addition to what Tim was saying. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I know there's, there's a gentleman on there. I'm going to... While he's walking down there, I'm going to add that uh, SIG Cloud Provider also works pretty closely with SIG Network, so a lot of uh, overlap in the people who participate in both. So if you're thinking like, I have specific problems specific to my cloud provider, either talk to SIG Cloud Provider or SIG Network and we'll connect you up. So for cloud providers, public cloud providers, what are the top couple things that we can do to move this effort forward? I think making it very easy to get a cluster that's configured correctly out of the box. And I think we're seeing that. I'm seeing more and more, more of the tools. I think there was a talk from the folks that work on COPS that they have IPv6 and how they implemented that. So more tools, implementation, so they can see it. And then just for managed service providers, make it very easy to get a cluster that's either IPv6 only, which I'm seeing a lot of, or dual stack out of the box. So I think making it really simple to deploy so that people can start using it and giving us more feedback on the specific features. That would be my goal, is making it really simple and across all the tooling. I think the talk was on COPS. If you can do it in COPS, I think that's a great start. Just having a way to get a cluster without understanding all the different flags and what order and what addresses you need and how to actually configure it all. That, that would be my suggestion. If you're a, if you're a provider, implement it and, yes. and do it this year. I'd like to see Detroit, all the major cloud providers have IPv6. We'll, we'll raise a toast for them. Um, if you're a customer, ask your cloud provider. Demand, when are you going to give me this? I need this. 
Go ahead. Oh, I, I, I gave somebody a mic, right? Or did I? There's, I lost my mic. mic's over this way. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, slightly wider question. What do you see as the future for network components like load balancers and traffic management in, in an IPv6 or dual stack world? I realize it's wider than Kubernetes. I mean, they're still going to play a part, right? Because they're not doing just... Do you, do, you mind, do you mind repeating the question, if you don't mind? Yeah. Uh, the question was uh, load balancers, um, whether they still play a part in a, either yeah. a v6 or a dual stack world. And they're going to play a part because they're doing things, more things than just NAT, which is what traditionally we kind of use load balancers for. Um, so the load balancing, things like AB, workflow, and, and deployments, is still going to be a part of the world. It's, it's almost built into how we run applications on Kubernetes. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's one little nuance in there that's interesting is what we've actually done under the hood is allow pods to have more than one IP address. Now, if you want to host, you know, virtual functions on top, sometimes these services need more than one interface. Yeah. Thank you. So again, if that's you, we've, we've created an implementation here that we can start to rationalize and discuss whether pods can have more than one interface in the same address family. We've kind of limited that. Sorry to lead the witness here. Lucky is uh, saying the quiet part out loud. We have opened a door to a new adjacent set of possibilities, which involve having multiple IP addresses. So like, that's the next can of worms. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, maybe hosting those applications on you know those network uh, function virtualization uh, may maybe an avenue that we could investigate through working on the dual stack work. Uh, there are no more virtual questions, so I think uh, we are kind of coming closer to the end. Uh, you know, maybe I'll take one more uh, after here after this gentleman. We're going to one go more until here. We're going to, go we're going to be here forever, out. yeah, <laughs> right, uh, until they kick us out. So we're going to be here, um, you know, definitely encourage, um, you know, some um, participation later. But uh, uh, let's take these two questions, and then I'll give you guys some time to kind of summarize, and then, you know, we can have the free-for-all for a while. All right, go for it. And now that IPsec is baking to the protocol itself, into IPv6, do you guys uh, see any possibility to have end-to-end -end encrypted communication between parts in Kubernetes by default? Short, short answer is yes. <laughs> yes. The, the long answer is uh, the great thing is now it can be transparent to the actual user. So the provider can actually ha do that handoff and you as the user could have end-to-end -end encryption on your network without having any uh, special software required or third-party software to do the negotiation of that IPsec tunnel. So I think it's, it's a re very interesting place, and that's one of the benefits of IPv6. And I think, you know, again, a lot of the community was stuck on, you know, let's, let's be clear, we, we took V6-only clusters and brought them along for the ride. They'd been stuck in alpha. And when we picked up dual stack, we said, we've got to take everything across the line here. Having all this core componentry in Kubernetes itself, I think now we can experiment with the bits and pieces because the conversation before was, well, Kubernetes doesn't support it, so therefore I can't do anything with it. And so I think, yes, you could bake that in. It should be transparent to the Kubernetes user, but we could get pretty crafty in IPv6 land where the, you know, south of the CNI, where you set up point to point uh, encryption out of the box and not have to deal with that at MTLS layer. That's just something you could do. And when, and, you, any when, you, say, when you say you, you're talking about the cluster administrator, you're talking about the, the managed yeah. service provider, like who do you see as the one who as is going to implement, implement this? Yeah, so I think, you know, if, if you have, hopefully the, the managed service provider can implement all this on your behalf. But if you are running your own clusters on premises and have this, the cluster administrator, as is the you. All right. This is a quick clarification on your quiet part said out loud a moment ago. Talking about multiple IP addresses for per pod, are you currently talking about limiting that to one per address family, or are you? That's how it's done today. We, we've inserted this um, mostly artificial check that just says, if you have two, they must be one v4 and one v6 in no particular order. Um, 
but we made the API design on purpose knowing that that rule will eventually probably be lifted. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think we're nearing, nearing the end. Maybe I can take one more question if there's one. Um, any questions? Uh, no? All right. So let's go ahead and start from there. Um, you want to summarize, uh, maybe call for action? Uh, you know, uh, sure. What do you think, um, you know, if you have the same panel next year? What do you think we're going to be talking? We are like, I, yeah. IPv6 is done, right? If, or no? If we have an IPv6 panel next year, I would really love it to be folks from the community who are implementing it, because we have one here, and I want to hear a little bit more about what you're implementing now. Um, but keep in mind that these conversations are not a broadcast of us to you. These are the conversations where you're telling your stories amongst each other over time and we're building together what you want it to be. So this is definitely not something where I received the wisdom of IPv6, now I know how it is. Like this is something you can, as you saw from these questions, construct the reality you want it to be. Yeah, I, I think, you know, my goal here today was just to educate and get the word out that this exists and that I would really love to see end users up here talking about their experience. And, you know, SIG Network, we're, we're listening as well. We want to hear if this works and meets the needs of the people that are trying to utilize it. So I think it's six months. I think if it's across all providers and there's one click, give me a, a Kubernetes cluster with dual stack or V6, uh, I think that would be a great outcome. I mean, I'd love to see more V6 only clusters, really, because there's a huge amount of the internet, you know, like, like GitHub, that you just don't know hasn't configured it. So getting more people using it, testing it, and feeding back to the entire internet community about what works and doesn't work, we're just going to keep pushing that V4 to V6 transition down the line. Mm -hmm. if, if we do another panel in uh, KubeCon North America, Detroit, I want it to be uh, people who are using dual stack V6, uh, not people who made it happen, but the people, <laughs> the people who are using it. And, and we can call it uh, 10 things I hate about dual stack in Kubernetes. <laughs> yes. That would be easy to do. You just yeah. wrote the CFP. <laughs> the sixth one will surprise you. <laughs> so again, thank you all for coming. I want to take a selfie. All of you are going to put up a six for the IPv6. Do you, do you mind, everybody? <laughs> all right, you, you, you gentlemen want to come here? Thank you very much for coming. And I really want to thank the panel.